good, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I hope that you had nice rest. And now we are ready to begin this second day of this autumn school of neuroimmunopharmacology at our University of Insubria. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, this, uh, the first speaker of this uh, uh, morning, which will be the dedicated to the session about uh, neuropsychopharmacology. And the first speaker is Manfred Shedlowski, uh, who is professor and director of the Institute of Medical Psychology and Behavioral Immunobiology at the Medical Faculty of the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany. He graduated uh, uh, in Hanover uh, in psychology and with a PhD at the Department of Medical Psychology at the Hanover Medical School. And uh, since 1997, uh, Manfred is full professor and director of the Institute of Medical Psychology and Behavi Behavioral Immunology. And uh, he had also an appointment as professor of psychology and behavioral immunobiology at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich in uh, Switzerland uh, from 2004 to 2007. And uh, as I told you also yesterday, uh, primary focus of current research of Manfred Shedlowski and of his uh, group is research in the neurobiology of placebo responses and in particular in the mechanisms and clinical relevance of behavioral of Pavlovian conditioning of immune functions. So I am absolutely pleased and honored to invite Manfred to give his lecture to all of us. Please Manfred. Ah, microphone, great. <laughs> now you can hear me, eh? <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for the nice introduction. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be here together with my colleague Harald Engler from the same institute in Essen. Uh, we arrived yesterday evening and uh, had a great dinner last night um, and a very, very nice uh, discussion with Marco. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce today a special aspect of this neuroimmune interaction, um, and this is the uh, behavioral conditioning of immune function. So all the, as this title says here, I'd like to show you that learning uh, can shape and can affect immunity, immune responses. Now, what I've heard from Marco is that sort of um, this is the mixture in the audience, a mixture of uh, different sort of qualifications, so medical doctors and mainly uh, biologists. Is that right, or do we have sort of some other professions here? So psychologists somewhere? Psychologists? No? No? Okay. <laughs> so I'm the only psychologist, actually. I'm a trained psychologist, <clears throat> but I'm working since many, many years um, because I'm in, in this field because I'm interested in this uh, interaction uh, between the brain, behavior, and the immune response. Now, this is the topic here, behavioral effects on immune functions. I'm interested in since I was uh, a PhD student at the Hanover Medical School, and um, since, uh, since then I'm uh, trying to understand how behavior is affecting the immune response and in particular I'm interested always in the mechanism because I like to understand how is that possible that behavior uh, such as stress for example or learning is uh, affecting the immune response and I'm also interested in the clinical relevance of these behavioral effects uh, on the immune system. So we are working with different models to analyze these behavioral effects on immunity. Uh, one is that we are trying to um, understand how and via which mechanism psychological stress, acute or chronic psychological stress, is affecting um, the immune response. 
We are also working with different kinds of behavioral interventions, <clears throat> so like physical activity um, or social support, cognitive stress management or relaxation, and try to understand how this behavior is affecting the immune response and in the next step also the development um, of different diseases. <clears throat> and disease outcome. And finally, this is our most favorite model here. We are working with this behavioral conditioning of immune functions and try to understand how learning is shaping immunity. Now, the talk today is <clears throat> focusing on this learning phenomenon. So, and uh, the basis of these behavioral effects in general on the immune response is the interaction between the brain and the peripheral immune functions. These two systems are constantly exchanging information um, and they do that on an efferent pathway by which the brain is affecting the immune response and also the immune system can signal, uh, send signals to the brain via an afferent arm here uh, <coughs> and this is then consequently or subsequently affecting behavior. Now, I think you've learned a lot yesterday during the talks of <coughs> Professor uh, of, of Marco and um, Rainer Straub, and uh, I think um, you've learned that this efferent arm, on this efferent arm, there are basically two pathways which are used by the brain to send signals to the immune system, and <coughs> one of these um, is a neural pathway, uh, um, and the major player is here is a sympathetic innervation of lymphoid organs. So we know today that all lymphoid organs, such as lymph nodes or the spleen, are innervated by noradrenergic nerve fibers. And the second pathway is going via the blood, via the peripheral blood. So we know that <clears throat> all neurotransmitters, hormones or neuropeptides can affect the migration or the circulation and the activity of immune cells um, via the blood. Now, a similar way is activated on this afferent arm when the immune system is signaling to the brain. Again, we have two pathways which sending or which are able to send signals to the brain and subsequently affect behavior. And <clears throat> one of these pathways is the vagus nerve, via which this information is sent to the brain. And the other pathway is also acting via the bloodstream, via cytokines, or so the messengers of the immune system, in particular so-called pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 or interleukin-6. Um, so this is the, if you want, the biochemical neuroanatomical basis of the interaction between behavior and the immune response. Now, <clears throat> the, the basis of what I'd like to uh, introduce today, so the learning paradigm, um, are the very early studies of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov here and <clears throat> You all remember these classical experiments in which uh, Pavlov conditioned the salivary response in dogs, what, the so-called classical conditioning. And this is just a sort of refreshment of the terminology. So this slide here. So you remember that during this conditioning or within this conditioning paradigm, the food presentation to a dog is inducing the salivary response. So the food and the terminology of the classical conditioning is the unconditioned stimulus, right? And the salivation, the unconditioned response. Okay. Now, if uh, or a, a neutral stimulus like the ring of the bell in the classical experiments of Pavlov is inducing no response. Okay. Now, during conditioning, the bell is presented together with the food and is, of course, then uh, inducing the salivary response in these animals. This is the training phase or the acquisition phase in the terminology of the classical conditioning. And after the conditioning, after this training phase, now the bell is able to induce the salivation. Now the bell is now becoming the conditioned stimulus 
and the salivation or salivary response, the conditioned response. Now, with a variation of this classical design of Pavlov, it is also possible to modify the immune response, um, the immune system. And uh, this is normally um, done in small animals, in rats or in mice, and this model is called taste aversion, learned taste aversion or conditioned taste aversion. Now, this is done, as I said, with small animals, mice or uh, rats, and during the learning phase, the acquisition phase, these animals are presented a novel tasting stimulus to drink, which is normally a sweet tasting solution, a saccharine solution, after which these animals, um, this is the condition stimulus, after which these animals receive an injection with an immunomodulating drug, which is the unconditioned stimulus. Now, after one, or better, several pairings um, of this conditioned stimulus together with the unconditioned stimulus, um, the animals are um, presented the conditioned stimulus alone, again, right, during the evocation or the memory phase. And now two things occurring. First of all, um, we see normally a conditioned taste aversion as a conditioned response on the behavioral level. That simply means that the animals drink less of this conditioned stimulus, of this saccharine um, solution. They don't like it anymore, right? More importantly for us, however, is the fact that the re-exposure to the conditioned stimulus, to the sweet taste, is now inducing the changes in the immune system which were formerly induced by the unconditioned stimulus, this immunomodulating um, drug. Now, over the last 20, 25 years, <clears throat> or 30 years actually, it could be shown that this model, model is a robust model to induce learned responses in the immune system. Um, and I'd like to show you um, uh, in the next um, few minutes a few examples of this, um, or early examples, early studies of this behavioral conditioned uh, immune response. So this is a, actually the time schedule or the schedule uh, of what I like to show you and present you in the next hour or so. So first of all, <clears throat> some early observations describing the phenomenon of this behavioral conditioned immune response. Then I'd like to introduce the model with which we are working since 10, 15 years um, of, a condition, of conditioning, the classical conditioning, in which we are using cyclosporin A, an immunopotent immunosuppressive drug, um, as an unconditioned stimulus. I'd like to show you then what we've learned over the last years um, regarding the efferent, afferent, and central mechanisms of behavioral conditioned immunosuppression, so the mechanisms steering this learned response in the immune system, um, and this, uh, in particular the efferent and central mechanism, because the afferent mechanisms um, are shown by uh, my colleague Harald Engler in the next talk after the break. And finally, I'd like to show you evidence that this learned immunosuppression is of clinical relevance because it can affect the disease outcome and it is also possible in humans. Why? First, the early observation. This is the first, very, very first observation documented in the literature which we found um, uh, um, describing these conditioned effects on uh, the immunity. This was published <coughs> very early here, 100 years ago, by Makukain and, and Voronov and Riskin, so Russian uh, scientists who were co-workers of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov in St. Petersburg in the early years of the last century. And then these, these co-workers of Pavlov, they observed a conditioned leukocyte reaction in their uh, rabbits. However, they could not explain what they observed, so they, they did not proceed with the work and said, okay, we can't explain it, so let's go ahead with some other model. Huh? But these were the first, very first reports. And there were also 
um, co-workers of uh, Pavlov, Mitalnikov and Korin, who uh, in the 20th of the last century worked at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And <clears throat> they observed that uh, guinea pigs survived lethal doses of several uh, or different bacteria when they have been conditioned before. So that was also an observation these scientists could not really explain. They documented that in these uh, different reports, but they could not, they did not have an explanation what was going on in the physiology, in the immune response. Right, the first sort of, or this phenomenon then was rediscovered um, 1975 by Bob Ader and Nick Coden from the University of Rochester. And these two scientists um, described a behavioral conditioned immunosuppression in rats. When the rats were sort of injected with an immunosuppressive drug called cyclophosphamide and were re in combination with a sort of um, the taste of a saccharine solution. And when these animals were re-exposed to the saccharine solution, these researchers observed a suppression in antibody teeters against sheep red blood cells. So <clears throat> this is shown here. So this is the condition group compared to the control group. You see here the suppression in antibody teeters. And that was actually the first documentation of such a learned beha or behavioral condition immunosuppression and actually the start of modern psychoneuroimmunology. So that was the start of this um, actually of this symposium here today, uh, 35 um, years ago. Now, <clears throat> since ever then, there were a number of studies um, confirming this early observation of uh, Ader and uh, Cohen. This, and then I'd like to show you just a few examples. This is an ex uh, example from, or a study from uh, Australian colleagues, Alex Kusnakov, uh, published 20 years or 30 years or 25 years ago in the Journal of Immunology, and they conditioned their rats with anti-lymphocyte serum in combination with the saccharine solution. And what they observed here is a conditioned suppression in the uh, T cell response here compare, in comparison to these control groups and a suppression by this learning phenomenon, a suppression by four, approximately uh, 40%. Now, the immune response can not only be suppressed by this learning phenomenon, but it can be also stimulated, so activated. And that has been shown by a few studies. Here's just one as an example, again here from this group from Nick Cohen and Robert Ada. Um, and they um, um, show that the immune response here is the conditioned group can be enhanced through the conditioned um, or through the learning here, this is the uh, antibody teeter, again, a B cell response induced or activated by this learning phenomenon. Now, again, a number of studies have shown, early studies 20, 30 years ago, that this is of potential clinical relevance. This is a science paper, very famous science paper, again, by Ader and Cohen, and uh, they were working with mice and uh, mice suffering from systemic lupus erythematosus, an autoimmune disease. What you can see here is the mortality rate of these animals. And here um, you can see this is the condition group here in, uh, of animals. And they um, had a decreased mortality rate in comparison to the sick animals, but not conditioned animals, which you can see here. So it is possible to affect the disease outcome with the conditioning process, and I'll come to the, back to this clinical relevance a little bit um, later. Now, that were some examples, more or less sort of uh, from historical value, um, showing that this um, learned immunosuppression is um, a robust model, and it is also of clinical relevance. So what we find, or what I find so fascinating with this model of behavioral conditioning is that you um, can, with one model, with one model, analyze the efferent pathways as well as the afferent pathways and also the central mechanisms processing this learning phenomenon just in one model. Yeah? Just one model for the 
analyzing the efferent pathway from the brain to the immune system and the afferent pathway from the immune system back to the brain and also the brain mechanisms steering this learning um, process. And by implementing different clinical models, you can also prove the clinical relevance of this learned um, immune response. And this is what I'd like to show you um, to the next slide uh, by focusing on the experiments we performed over the last 10 to 15 years with this um, immunosuppressive drug, um, cyclosporin A. And this is <coughs> what I'd like to introduce you uh, first, this model. So this is the drug we are using. Cyclosporin A is a very potent immunosuppressive drug, which is widely used in the clinical practice. Wherever a suppression of immune functions in patients is required, so it's a standard therapeutic um, agent in transplantation medicine, for example, to prevent the, prevent, uh, the transplanted organ from rejection. And cyclosporin A is also used in many, many other autoimmune diseases to suppress the immune functions. What? So cyclosporin A is a so-called calcineurin inhibitor. So calcineurin is an intracellular um, messenger and by suppressing this calcineurin activity, it, it, cytosporin A is suppressing the synthesis and release of many cytokines, in particular interleukin-2. And because there is no interleukin-2 anymore, or less interleukin-2, this is affecting the proliferation, the activity of T lymphocytes, of T cells. So cytosporin A, in summary, is relatively specifically suppressing the T cell response. Now, we're using this as an unconditioned stimulus, and this is the basic protocol we are normally using. So we are normally working with rats, with dark agouti rats, DA rats, um, and with cyclosporin A, 20 milligram, which we inject um, intraperitoneal um, into these rats as an unconditioned stimulus. And as a conditioned stimulus, we normally use saccharine, so a sweet tasting solution from which we know that the rats love to drink it. So they normally sort of drink much more of this, uh, of this uh, saccharine uh, in comparison to normal water. Yeah? Now, this is a protocol we are using with these animals. <clears throat> so we put the animals on a water deprivation. That means that these animals learn a week before we start the experiment to consume the fluid they need in the morning for 50 minutes and in the afternoon for 50 minutes, right? So this is the training protocol here. Then we start with the actual training, right? So we give them an injection with cyclosporin A together with this sweet tasting solution, with a saccharine solution. Then we um, repeat that three times. So we induce three training trials, if you want. So train the animal three times here with two or three days apart. Then we wait and for another three days, and then we re-expose the animals to the saccharine, to the sweet-tasting solution or the, to the conditioned stimulus. What? And then one hour after the last CS re-exposure, we sacrifice the animals and perform our assay. So this is a normal standard protocol we're using. These are the groups we're using. <clears throat> so basically four groups. This is the, the first group is our main condition group. So you can see here during the training phase in the morning, they receive saccharin together with cyclosporin A, right? And then these animals during the evocation here are re-exposed to the saccharin. Then we have our, our main control group. This is a non-contingent condition group or basically a sham conditioned group of animals. These animals receive water in combination with saccharine, uh, with, sorry, with cyclosporin A here, and are re-exposed to water during evocation. Then we include normally two more control groups. This one group is a CSA-treated group, uh, group of animals. Um, these animals are identically treated like, with, like the sham-conditioned animals, so water in combination with cyclosporin A. However, during the evocation trials, these animals receive an injection with 20 milligrams cyclosporin A, 20 milligrams per kilo cyclosporin A, if you want a short-term treatment with the drug. Right? And then we always include 
I completely non-treated group of animals uh, in the hope that we can uh, evaluate our conditioned, um, our conditioned uh, effects in comparison to the cyclosporine A treated animals and the completely untreated animals. What? Now, if you have questions, sorry, if you have questions, if I'm too quick or not explaining things precisely enough, please lift your arm and say, hey, that was not good. Repeat it, right? Okay? Wonderful. So, can you summarize what I've said before? <laughs> no, no, just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, again, this is the behavioral conditioned response, the taste aversion, right? Here's the saccharine consumption here, and here are the training period, the, and here's the evocation, the three evocations for the control group and the condition group. What you can see here, this is a normal drinking, normal um, drinking phase here in the control group. However, we always observe a, what we call a behavioral condition taste aversion in these animals. So these animals just drink less of this sweet solution, right? Here. Yeah. So more, more importantly, however, for us is that the re-exposure to the condition stimulus is affecting the immune response. And this is shown as an example here, one of more than a dozen experiments which we performed, or I think 20 experiments we performed over the years. This is the proliferation of lymphocytes in the spleen. So this so-called splenocyte proliferation. And here is the interleukin-2 level from the supernatants of the proliferating lymphocytes. Right? Here are the four groups, as you can see here. This is the, um, the non-treated group of animals, gray always. This is a shem-conditioned group. Here, here's the CSA-treated group, so these animals who, which receive the um, treatment with the cyclosporine A. And here is the conditioned uh, group. And you can see here in the proliferation, as well as the cytokine in the interleukin to production, there is a behavioral conditioned suppression of lymphocyte activity in interleukin-2. And you can show that or see that on different levels. Here's the mRNA expression of the cytokines, interleukin-2 and gamma interferon here and, um, as well. Um, and you can see here the same pattern of responses, so a clear behavioral condition suppression of mRNA ex, uh, expression of these two um, cytokines. Now, when we saw these results, uh, we were quite happy. We repeated the experiments, identical results, and then we, of course, immediately started to ask, how is that possible? How is that possible that a re-exposure to the sweet taste, the sweet taste alone, is inducing sort of uh, a, an immune uh, suppression like this in the measured in the cytokine response and in the activity of the uh, T lymphocyte. And um, we first of all concentrated here on the efferent pathway, on the efferent arm of this behavioral conditioned um, immunosuppression. And I'd like to show you now with the next slide some of the data which we <coughs> in which we analyze this potential mechanism. Now, first of all, we concentrated on this arm here. We wanted to know how the brain is able to signal to the immune system and tell the immune system be suppressed just by mere exposure or re-exposure to this sweet taste. Now, first of all, we uh, try to answer this question. Are these residual effects of the drug, are there still uh, cyclosporine A in the, in, the, in the circulation, or is this, this due to a stress effect? So that our model, behavioral model, is inducing a stress effect. So this is inducing an increase in glucocorticoids, which are known to be immunosuppressive, and via the increase in glucocorticoids, so the immune system gets suppressed during this learning period. So we tested that in a number of experiments. Here's just one example. These here are the cyclosporine A levels during the last evocation, so when we assayed our, um, these animals. And as you can see here, cyclosporine A is only detectable in the circulation in the CSA-treated animals, but not in um, the animals of the other groups. So no detectable cyclosporine A anymore in the circulation. It has 
Also, nothing to do with the stress-induced increase in corticosterone or glucocorticoids, as you can see here. So no group differences in this stress hormone. So therefore, we can exclude that this has something to do with residual effects or with um, uh, stress effects. Now, the next question then, or the next uh, point we focus on is a sympathetic nervous system. Because as I said before, we know today that many, many lymphoid organs, if not all lymphoid organs, are innervated by nerve fibers of the sympathetic nervous system and mainly innervated by noradrenergic nerve fibers. So <clears throat> we concentrated on um, this uh, particular pathway. And what we did is what we, we, we performed a sp uh, splenic denervation. The spleen, there's a nerve, sort of um, the sympathetic nerve innervating the spleen, and you can um, cut a, pee, a piece of the splenic nerve to interrupt the sympathetic innervation. So we did that in an experiment, so we performed this surgical denervation of the spleen and then conditioned our animals and assayed um, <coughs> these. Well, this, what we found is the uh, decreased adrenaline, in particular no adrenaline content in the spleen, in the denervated animals in comparison to the shem denervated animals, as you can see here. And as a consequence we, of this denervation of the spleen, we could not observe anymore a behavioral conditioned response and a behavioral conditioned immunosuppression. As can be seen here, this is the proliferation again of the lymphocytes in the spleen, a cyclosporine A effect, but no behavioral conditioned effect anymore. Right. And this can be also seen in the interleukin-2 and gamma interferon uh, levels, a cyclosporine A effect here, the red bars, but no behavioral conditioned effect anymore so that we can conclude that this conditioned response is uh, basically mediated via the sympathetic nervous system, via, via the splenic nerve. Now, we also know um, that no adrenaline is the main mediator of this behavioral conditioned response and that this is mediated again by beta adrenoceptors. I do not show you the data because it's going to be too much then, but if we sort of um, give these animals, treat these animals with a neurotoxin, wiping out the no adrenaline response in the periphery, we can block the conditioned response. And if we treat, pre-treat the animals with beta blockers, to, uh, to block these adrenergic receptors, we can also completely block the behavioral conditioned response. So what we've learned here from these experiments is that this pathway here of the learning process is mediated via the splenic nerve, via noradrenaline, and via beta adrenergic receptor dependent processes. What? So we've learned a little bit about um, this pathway. Now, we were then interested in the question, okay, we learned here something, but where are these and how are these learning processes sort of taking place in the brain? All right, so we were interested uh, for a couple of years with one or two or three research projects in the brain mechanisms. So, and here we did not sort of start from the very beginning because what we've learned from our colleagues from neurobiology um, who are involved in analyzing the sort of mechanism of associative learning, these colleagues are using this taste aversion, this taste avoidance model um, for their research. And from this research, we knew that the insular cortex and the amygdala in particular, also the VMH, the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus, are involved in the at least behavioral response uh, of this associative learning of um, this taste aversion, taste avoidance. Now, what we did was we performed a quite large experiment in which we performed brain lesions, not really the whole brain, of course, but we lesioned either the insular cortex, the VMH, or the amygdala before the acquisition, before the training because we wanted to know whether these brain areas would also be involved in um, the sort of in the learning, in the learning response during the training. And then a couple of other groups of animals, we performed these identical lesions 
after the acquisition, after the training, but before the evocation. So that could give us information about the involvement of these brain areas in the memory process. All right, so lesions either before the training or before the evocation, same groups, control groups, same conditioning protocol. Now this is a very complicated slide, the summary, the splenocyte proliferation, the same data uh, were observed, observed for the cytokine analysis. And uh, I walk you, as people say, I walk you through this slide. So. This is, um, here are the control groups. So this is the open cage control, the shem condition animals, the cyclosporinate treated animals. Here are the data where we lesioned the animals before the training, before the acquisition. And here on the right hand are the data uh, where we lesioned the animals after the training but before the evocation. Now what we learned here from this experiment that in particular the insular cortex and the amygdala are involved in this learning process, not the VMH. But when we lesion the insular cortex, you can see here we can block the behavior conditioned response, use the shem animals, shem lesioned animals, and also when we lesion the amygdala here, we can block this um, behavior conditioned response. So a slight different situation occurs when we do the lesions, when we perform the lesions after the learning, so before the memory phase. Again, the insular cortex is involved also in the learning, uh, in the, sorry, in the memory process. As you can see here, if we lesion the amygdala, we can block the behavioral condition suppression here. Um, however, this is not the case with the amygdala, so the amygdala seems to be only involved in the learning but not in the memory process. And um, here also the VMH the, uh, seem to be involved in the memory uh, process. So in summary, what we've learned here that this sort of connection of the con conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus, is taking place during the learning in the amygdala and in, in the insular cortex and the amygdala and the memory of this process when you sort of re-expose the animals to the conditioned stimulus, then uh, again the insular, cor uh, insular cortex is playing a central role but not anymore the amygdala. Right, so <clears throat> again we're still with the mechanisms. Um, however, um, as I said before, um, we are currently uh, still trying to understand how the immune system is signaling during this learning process to the brain. Um, and we uh, performed a number of experiments and Harald Engler after this talk will introduce uh, some of these data and what we've learned about um, during the last couple of years um, about this afferent pathway from the immune system to the brain. With the last slide regarding the mechanisms, I'd like to focus um, on the so-called specificity of the immune response. Because we have been very often asked by many colleagues um, when we presented our data, uh, and the question was always, okay, that is fascinating, that's great, but how specific is that, what you're doing there with your conditioning process? Is that really specifically mimicking the response of the cyclosporin A, of the drug you're using, or is it like, you know, smashing with a hammer on the immune system and pap, you know, and wiping out many, many different immune responses. And we could always say, now we think it is specific, but, you know, but we did not have really data on that. So the last couple of years we were uh, focusing also on this question of specificity. And uh, I'd like to show you some data here. So this is the first hint that it is quite specific what we're doing here because here we sort of switch the immunological assay and instead of using unspecific mitogenes we are specifically um, activated the T cell re receptor, the, so the receptor on the T cells by using anti-CD3 for our sort of immune stimulation. 
And basically what you can see here in this, uh, this again, there's T-cell proliferation in the spleen, basically the same pattern of results here, the, the, the control group, the cyclosporine treated animals, and here the behavioral conditioned um, animal, a clear suppression. Now, as I said before, cyclosporine A is a so-called calcineurine inhibitor, inhibiting this intracellular mechanism in particular, not the protein, but the activity of the protein. And you can measure that. Um, and we did that in this experiment here. And this is the outcome. Here's the calcineurine activity and the calcineurine protein expression for these different groups. And again, in the activity, you see the same pattern of changes here. Or pattern or differences between these groups. So this is a control group again. Here the shem condition animal, cyclosporine A treated, but also a very clear signal in the behavioral conditioned animals. Oh, the calcineurine activity in the T cells from uh, generated from the spleen. However, the protein expression is not affected. So therefore, we can say what well, it is relatively specific what we are doing with the conditioned. Uh, model. Now we followed this track further because we were interested in the question, okay, how is the conditioning process doing that? How is the conditioning process reducing the calcineurine activity in the cell of these conditioned rats? Why? Because there was nothing described in the literature which could help us. So we performed in vitro experiments because, as I said before, we know that the conditioning process is mediated via beta-adrenergic receptors, by the activity of these beta-adrenergic receptors and no adrenaline. So what we did is we uh, established an in vitro assay in which we stimulated T lymphocytes <coughs> from um, the spleen of rats with um, terbutaline. Terbutaline is a beta-adrenergic Agonist. So we stimulated these beta adrenergic uh, receptors, as you can see here. Um, there was a suppression we observed in the different concentration, a suppression in IL-2, gamma interferon, and in the T cell proliferation, but not, and we did not expect any results here, but not uh, for IL-4, so interleukin-4 uh, levels remained constant. All right. However, <coughs> here the because IL-4, as you might know, is mainly produced by so-called Th2 um, um, cells, so CD4 uh, cells, T cells, and uh, these cells do not express receptors for these um, uh, for no adrenaline. So they do not express beta adrenergic receptors. However, these so-called Th1 cells, which producing interleukin-2 and gamma interferon, they are expressing these beta adrenergic receptors. So that was a <clears throat> results as we expected that, but then the next question occurs, how can this sort of affect the uh, calcineurine activity? Again, we also measured the calcineurine activity in these cells, and what we observe is, again, a clear reduction here in the calcineurine activity in that, sorry, I forgot to say that this, this response can be blocked by um, nadolol, which is an antagonist blocking these receptors. Right? <clears throat> and the same is true with the calcineurine activity in these CD4 positive cells, so T lymphocytes. And uh, what we then we, we performed a time kinetic. Here's the calcineurine activity uh, after stimulation with terbutaline. So here's the sort of um, terbutaline and nadolol. So the terbutaline is reducing the calcineurine activity to a similar extent like cyclosporine A is doing that. However, this effect is gone after four to six hours. So it's a transient inhibitory effect of the calcineurine activity induced by the beta or activation of beta adrenergic um, receptors. So what we think is what we have here an in vitro model explaining at least partially our behavioral conditioned effect on this um, on the T cell um, activity. And uh, sort of we try to switch that uh, now from the rat model to the, to the human model. 
And uh, what we've learned so far from the rat model is that this is seemed to be a, a novel link, uh, a pathway between these beta adrenoceptors and the T cell receptor signaling um, in CD4 positive cells, inhibiting the calcinorine activity. And what we've learned so far that this seemed to be uh, a PKA, a protein kinase A dependent uh, mechanism. <clears throat> but we have to. Um, sort of analyze that in more details um, in a human model. So in the human model, because we are limited with our tools uh, in the red model, because um, we have to either switch to the mice or to the um, humans, and uh, when they say in two years' time, when Marco is organizing the next symposium, I might be able to sort of introduce then new data on these intracellular um, mechanisms. Now, so far, to the, so far to the mechanisms, what we've learned over the years. Now, I will switch on to the potential um, clinical relevance of this behavioral conditioned or learned immunosuppression. And uh, this is why. This is a nice, nice slide, yeah. <laughs> that should remind me um, that the first time I sort of was involved in this question whether and to what extent this is of clinical relevance what we are doing there with this learned immunosuppression that was during a postdoc stay which I did 20 years ago at the Department of Psychology at the University of Newcastle in Australia and Newcastle is a smaller university town it's located here at the east coast of um, uh, Australia, here 150 kilometers north of Sydney, and during that time we really had optimal working conditions, as you can see here, that was the view out of the lab, so to the Newcastle Beach here, where we very often had uh, our lunch, and uh, during that time, or that was a time when I used to send postcards like uh, back home, so like this year, beer's great, locals very friendly, regards from Newcastle, so uh, I had really a good time over there. Now, with my Australian colleagues, in particular uh, Alan Husband and Maury King, we performed an experiment in which we um, could observe a behavioral condition prolongation of heart allograft survival in the red. So that was the very first experiments we performed over there. And um, when I returned to the Hanover Medical School, uh, I was not involved anymore in the sort of learning and behavioral conditioning because I started a project in which we were uh, analyzing the effect of acute psychological stress uh, on, in particular, the response of natural killer cells in humans. Um, and because this project started immediately after my return from Australia, I did not have time anymore to follow these very interesting results, uh, which we... Um, got there with this heart transplantation model, but I um, switched to another model in which we investigated um, tandem parachutists, so inexperienced parachutists before, during, and after the first jump out of an airplane, because we realized that this is an excellent stress model which, we, which you can use in human, and which is inducing a very, very great stress response, a very large and pronounced stress response. And we investigated sort of in particular what's going to happen during this acute stress in the hormone system, in the endocrine system, and also what is in particular what's going on in the immune system because at that time it was not really clear that psychological stress is inducing changes in the immune system. That was challenged by in particular my colleagues of immunology, because they said, okay, what does stress have to do um, with the immune response? Nothing. What? And um, these data, or this is one of many, many studies which were performed during this time, so 20 years ago, um, which show that the acute stress, psychological stress, but also chronic psychological stress is affecting the immune response. And this is just one of the main results which we observed here. So this is the NK cell numbers here, um, and here the time points where we got the blood uh, from the subject, so four hours before the stress, four hours before the jump, actually. That 
This sample is directly after the jump, uh, one hour and four hours later, and this group of jumpers, they received a placebo because we in, um, uh, had a uh, few groups in this experiment. And as you can see here, there was a steep increase in the case numbers, two, 300 percent increase in the numbers of these immune cells uh, and a normalization one to four hours later. And these um, stress-induced responses could be completely blocked again by pretreating these subjects, these jumpers with propranolol, a beta blocker, because at the, from the first experiments we got indications that this response is also mediated via the sympathetic nervous system. And when we pretreat these jumpers with propranolol, as you can see here, we could almost completely block this stress induced increase. And then there was another question raised by our immunologists, they said, okay, if you find all these numbers, cell numbers, these increases in NKSA numbers, where are these cells are coming from? And they had the hypothesis that these cells are coming from the spleen. So during acute stress situation, these cells will be um, sort of spoiled out of the spleen into the bloodstream. Uh, because the spleen, as you know, is the largest source of immune cells in the body. So we tested this hypothesis by asking splenectomized young men to perform jumps for us. There were young men, young people from our medical school, they were not operated and splenectomized because they wanted to jump for us, but they were sort of, they had, had accidents. So car accidents, motorcycle accidents, and the spleen had to be removed by the surgeons. So we asked them to perform jumps for us, and as you can see here, this is the results of the splenectomized subjects here. They show basically the same pattern. They start with higher numbers because there's no spleen, um, of course, and then, however, they also show this nice stress-induced increase and the drop later and the normalization four hours later, basically the same response. And we know today that these cells during acute stress, physical stress, so sport activity, as well as psychological stress, are not coming from the spleen. These cells are coming from the so-called marginal pool, so the endothelial, so the inner wall of the blood um, vessels. So with the stimulus of these uh, stress hormones, adrenaline, no adrenaline, these cells sort of just get released from the endothelial walls into the bloodstream, and this is the reason why these cell numbers increase by two, three, four hundred percent immediately. So that was, that kept me busy for a couple of years, actually. This is just one experiment of a really number of experiments, and it kept me busy, and I found this uh, a very nice model, and what we've learned over the years that is to in Use in a case of response like that, it is not necessary to throw people out of aeroplanes. So we, you can also induce these kind of responses when you ask, for example, people to give a public speech, for example, in a lab situation. So then after a couple of years, I returned to this old um, learning model, what I've learned in Australia together with my colleagues there, and I concentrated in these studies on the, also on the question again for the clinical relevance, potential clinical relevance of this learned immune response. And uh, again, we performed an experiment with a slightly modified um, protocol compared to what we did in Australia a number of years ago. However, this is <coughs> the same, this, these are the same groups uh, like in the other experiments I showed you, the same four groups. We conditioned the animals in the same way as I've showed you before. However, this time um, we did not sacrifice the animals after the third re-exposure to the conditioned stimulus, but we performed a heterotopic heart transplantation in the rat. Right? So we transplanted, these are the reds, the DA reds, dark aguti reds, here the gray ones, and these reds received the heart of a donor of a Lewis red. Right? And Lewis 2 DA is a fully MHC incompatible strain combination, and a heart, a Lewis heart in a DA red recipient is surviving eight to nine days in an untreated uh, red. Right? 
So this is not a technique we invented. This is a standard technique in experimental transplantation medicine. And the donor heart, oh, sorry, the donor heart is transplanted into the abdomen of the recipient. All right, so this Lewis rat is transplanted into the abdomen of the DA rat by enterocyte anastomosis of the inferior vena cava um, and the donor pulmonary arteria and the donor aorta and the recipient aorta. Such a heart is nourished normally. It's uh, beating normally. And you can sort of check the, um, the function of this heart by daily palpation. So the only thing you have to do to see if it's palpating or not. So it's an on or off signal. If it's palpating, it's not rejecting. Uh, if it's not palpating anymore, it is rejected. Right. <clears throat> so when we perform these experiments, again, here are the four different groups, which you know already. Here's the survival rate in the days here of these uh, different groups. What we observed was a behavioral conditioned significant um, prolongation of heart allograft survival in these here conditioned animals in, um, comparable to uh, those animals which receive the short-term treatment with the drug. So this is a highly statistically significant uh, effect. And when we discussed that with our colleagues from transplantation medicine, they said, yeah, that's okay. Um, something is going on here, but can you really talk about clinical significant or yeah, clinical significant if you can show a prolongation of three to four or five days? What shall we tell our patients so that we're going to condition you, operate you, and your heart will beat five days or longer or not? So this is something is going on, but we have to increase it. That was one argument we kept in mind, and the other one was. Um, basically the fact that it's very unlikely that these conditioning or learning protocols will be of value one day as a standalone therapy. It makes only sense in combination with the pharmacological therapy. So we try to keep that in mind and try to put that into an experimental design. Again, four groups of animals, same groups, conditioning protocol here. Um, this time, again, the operation, the transplantation. However, this time we treated these animals, all animals in all groups, with a subtherapeutical dose of cyclosporine A. So all animals received two milligrams of cyclosporine A every second day. We tested that beforehand, a clear subtherapeutical doses of cyclosporine A. Now, when we perform this experiment in that way, then we see a slightly different picture. A behavioral condition response, a prolongation in the conditioned group here, uh, and this time, three out of ten animals received a fun fully functional heart al also here 100 days post-transplantation, indicating that the 30% of animals um, um, developed, if you want, tolerance against this MHC, completely incompatible uh, donor heart. We say, or we said, um, tolerance, however, we, we never tested that immunological-wise, right? <clears throat> but people, uh, in transplantation immunologists talk about tolerance if this heart is not rejected, the organ is not rejected after 100 days. And they were fully functional um, 100 days post-transplantation. Now, we said, okay, this is great. This is much better. Um, let's try to repeat this, um, which is always difficult, yeah? So repeating the sort of own experimental uh, results. Um, and then we wanted to see whether or not this prolongation here of heart allograft survival is also mediated by the splenic nerve. So what we did was we performed a splenic denovation, a surgical denovation of the spleen, like in these other experiments I showed you before. Then we conditioned the animals, then we transplanted the animals, and the outcome was that Again, we could more or less repeat our results here now with um, two out of nine animals receiving a fully functional heart 100 days post-transplantation, and that was completely blocked by prior surgical denovation, indicating that this effect is also mediated via um, the splenic nerve. <clears throat> now, during that time, we were quite happy uh, to see these results, to, you know, we said, okay, this is maybe the way we have to go. So combine the 
um, cyclosporine A treatment and the conditioning model with this uh, subtherapeutical treatment of the drug. Um, however, um, we performed the next very simple experiments a couple of years later, um, which gives us an indication that this effect here has much more to do with learning than we thought before. In this experiment, very simple, we try to um, analyze whether or not we have to use such a more or less complicated training protocol. And we had the idea in the background that maybe one training trial and one re-exposure might be enough, so that saves time and money, of course. Now, we try, we systematically very, uh, sort of um, uh, vary this, um, or use the systematic variation of this learning protocol in uh, doing sort of just one training trial, one re-exposition, one training trial, three re-exposition, three re-exposition, one, no, sorry, three training trials, one re-exposition, and this is the protocol we are normally using here, down here. Now, <clears throat> what we observed here is a clear learning effect. As you can see here, this is the cyclosporine A um, animals. These are these uh, animals receiving three injections with cyclosporine A. This is uh, control animals. And as you can see, here's a dose response curve, a very nice dose response curve, showing that the more we train our animals and the more we re expose them to this conditioned stimulus, the more they are the larger and the more pronounced this behavioral conditioned effect, indicating again that this is not only a learning phenomenon, phenomenon but maybe also indicating that what we have observed in the transplantation model um, is really um, due to this learning um, effect. Now, I, for time reasons, I think I skip this one, just showing that it's not restricted, only restricted to uh, the transplantation model, but this is also working uh, in an um, allergic response. I skip that, um, showing basically um, that this is also working uh, with other uh, autoimmune um, diseases. Now, when, we, when you're talking about clinical relevance, it's always nice if you can show that this is working in your rats and in your mice, right? But the final proof is, of course, to show that this is working in humans. And this is what um, we, uh, I'd like to show you within, with the next 10, 15 slides, that this is also uh, working, this learned immunosuppression in humans. Now, this is a study design of an experiment we performed a number of years ago. Um, in which we behavioral conditioned young, healthy male subjects. Now, we try to keep as close as possible to these uh, red experiments which we performed. So, and condition the um, uh, young men with a cyclosporine A, so 2.5 milligrams per kilo. Uh, that was a condition group, or the other group received a placebo together with a novel tasting drink as a conditioned stimulus. So the cyclosporine A pill they had to swallow were the unconditioned stimulus, the drink, the conditioned stimulus. We performed that four times, so four training trials. Then we waited for six days and asked the subjects to come back to the lab. And now both groups received a placebo with the conditioned stimulus here with a drink. Now we took four blood samples in order to analyze um, the conditioned effect and the drug effect. So a baseline, first baseline sample, a second sample after the training period to, in particular, to determine our drug effects. Then a third sample when the subjects return to the lab to determine the possible residual effects of the drug. And a fourth sample here in particular to determine the behavioral conditioned uh, effects. Now these are the pills. This is the green drink. This was a, or is still, we're currently working with this model again. This is a green colored strawberry milk with a drop of lavendel. So lavendel is that what you find in mod board. So it's a very unique, very uh, not good taste. So some of our subjects like the taste, maybe 10, 15%. We do not know why, but most of our subjects, they, they hate it. They hate it. They don't want it, all right? <clears throat> But what we learned in the pre-experiments, the pilot studies, is that uh, we are well advised to look for a stimulus which is new, 
uh, looking new and tasting new. Right? Now, this is, uh, these are the cyclosporine A levels, which we uh, detect in our subject here during the conditioning phase. And here, of course, cyclosporine A is only detectable in the peripheral blood in those subjects who receive cyclosporine. A, of course, not in placebo subject. More importantly, however, there was no cyclosporine A in the, in, in the, in the circulation anymore when the subjects returned after uh, six days. Now, here's one of these uh, main results. Here's the cytokine mRNA expression in the peripheral blood lymphocytes of these subjects. Here's the interleukin-2, the gamma interferon. Here's the cyclosporine A effect. Here's the sort of before the re-exposition when the subjects return to the lab, and here's the behavioral condition risk effect. You see a clear cytosporine A effect, but also a very clear and very pronounced behavioral condition suppression of this mRNA expression in these peripheral uh, blood lymphocytes. And you can measure that on different levels. Again, here's the protein, the interleukin-2 production from the supernatant of the proliferating lymphocytes. Again, here the same results also for gamma interferon. Here's IL-2. Here's the CSIA effect, and here the conditioned effect. And um, you can measure that also in the lymphocyte uh, proliferation. Here are uh, the CSA effect and here the behavioral conditioned effect. So that we, from this study, had a proof of principle, if you want, that this learned immunosuppression is also possible um, in humans. Now, we, as I said before, we're currently uh, working with this uh, model again. So we restarted these experiments uh, two years or three years ago. And I'd like to show you some uh, very new data of these um, currently ongoing experiments. And uh, we try to, and uh, Marco mentioned that in his introduction, we are more and more sort of interested in the placebo response because what we're doing here is part of a placebo response because what we've learned from the placebo response is that this response is mediated via the expectation of patients towards the benefit of a treatment and via this kind of learning process, associative learning processes. Now, in this context, we try to answer in this ongoing project a number of um, very important questions, in particular towards the clinical relevance of this learned immunosuppression. And one is a uh, very important question, can the learned immune response be reproduced, re-enlisted? Because as we showed in this proof of principle, if it's possible one time, it's still a very fascinating and interesting model to analyze these efferent and afferent pathways um, with which the brain and the immune system are communicating. However, then it is quite useless for the clinical practice. Right? And one important question for us was, can we reproduce that? Now, again, we, we have a conditioned healthy male subjects mainly medical students, but not all. All of them were medical students. Again, with the same protocol I've introduced to you um, in the first experiment. So the acquisition phase, the learning phase here, the evocation after five days waiting period. And now we ask the subject to return to the lab after a period of 11 days and gave them just the placebo and the condition stimulus and the drink. And we analyzed um, the blood samples and uh, this is what we found. First of all, here the CSA level here during the acquisition, and again, only uh, CSA levels um, detectable in the experimental group. Um, these are, by the way, CSA levels you also find in transplant patients when they're receiving the cyclosporine A or other immunosuppressive drug. So this is a clinical level of cyclosporine A. In these experiments, we also tested the condition taste aversion against this green drink, this green flavored uh, strawberry milk. And we, to our surprise, we observed also a behavioral conditioned avoidance, averted, aversion, so against this um, green um, conditioned uh, stimulus in the experimental group here. However, more importantly, um, we could repeat this behavioral conditioned suppression of immune functions here shown by the IL-2 levels and gamma interferon levels. Here's the acquisition phase, and you can see here's a clear sort of suppression 
due to the cyclosporine A, but also we observed during the evocation a clear suppression, behavioral condition suppression in IL-2 levels and a very small response, however significant response, in the gamma interferon level. So we could repeat and replicate our own results, which is very important because you, you know the saying, never try to replicate your own results. So this is always dangerous, right? But we were happy to, that we sort of could repeat that. And we this time asked the subject to return to the lab after 11 days. And then they got the placebo and the drink again. And what we found here is again um, a behavioral conditioned inhibition of IL-2 response and also of gamma interferon response here in the subjects showing that this response can be reproduced at least on two different occasions. Of course, we have to now to see how long this can be re-exposed and when we could expect a sort of extinction of this learned immune response. A very uh, important question. Now, very New results as well here in this experiment. We performed another experiment in which we tried to analyze uh, we always have some people to this, uh, to this condition stimulus. Some of these responses are even larger than the drug effect. And some of these subjects are, do not respond at all or even they show re really an increase in, for example, IL-2 response. And this is a big issue, a big question in the neurobiology in the, of the placebo response to understand why some people really react very, very strong to a placebo and other people do not respond at all. So our understanding of these different responses is zero, more or less. Right? And we started here in this behavioral condition or learned immunosuppression to look for these um, responders, non-responders. So, same conditioning protocol, your control, and this time we had 32 um, um, subjects in the experimental group um, to be able to divert, so to distinguish responders and non-responders. Now, what we observe here is just the, um, the IL-2 response. Here's the CSA effect here, a clear suppression in the IL-2 um, response. And also, again, a behavioral condition response, approximately 40% of this drug effect, right, due to our conditioning protocol. Now, then we divided this um, subjects into responder and non-responder, and the cutoff uh, was one standard deviation of IL-2 um, from this control group here, because we see this as a natural variation of the IL-2 response. We take, took that as a cutoff, and then sort of um, having when we take this cutoff, this 11.6 picogram per mil, we have, uh, we stayed with 15 responders and 17 non-responders. These are the start responders, reduction in IL-2 response. Here the non-responders, no response or even an enhancement in IL-2 response. Now, when we then sort of compare the IL-2 response in these two groups, in the control group, the responders and the non-responders, this is the CSA effect here, and this is the conditioned effect in the responders, and here the con a effect or conditioned effect in the non-responders. You see here in the responders, in the average, the effect is almost as large as the drug effect. Now, then we tried to find out what is the difference between these responders and non-responders. And we analyzed a number of psychological and physiological parameters and just tried to compare these two groups and see whether they significantly differ in one of these variables. And we found no differences in age, BMI, physical activity, psychological variables like depression, anxiety, personality variables. We also did not find any variation, any differences before or after acquisition or evocation in other parameters like heart rate, blood pressure, CSA levels, cortisol, or the adrenaline, no adrenaline, or the cell numbers, for example. No difference whatsoever. Then, in the next step, we performed a multiple regression analysis. And in particular, 
we analyzed um, also um, or the para parameters during the evocation. So does sort of the data before the evocation, before they drink sort of this, this stimulus, um, when we do the baseline uh, measures, do that predict any responses? And what we observed here that in particular, no adrenaline plasma levels and the state anxiety, the anxiety score, are predicting 40% of the variance. And if we then include also the IL-2 baseline levels, we have, um, we have a almost um, 0.6 um, uh, or 60 percent, explaining 60 percent of the variance of the conditioned IL-2 response, and this is a, a, a very large, a very big number. Uh, so that um, we can say here that uh, in this model, in particular, the noradrenaline level and also the state anxiety are predicting this behavioral conditioned response, this learned um, immune response. Now, this shows in so in general, that it is possible to um, distinguish responder and non-responders in this sort of, at least in this model of the learned immunosuppression. Whether this is also um, true for other learned immune responses or for other placebo responses like placebo responses in pain, the so-called pain analgesia um, is a completely different uh, question. Now, I'm ending now by summarize, briefly summarizing what I've shown with the cyclosporine A model. So what we know here is a little bit more about this efferent pathway from the brain to the immune system. It's no residual effect, no stress effect. It's mediated via the splenic nerve, no adrenaline, beta-2 adrenoceptors. Um, expressed on the T cells. We know that the insular cortex and the amygdala is mediating this learned effect. You will hear a little bit more about this afferent arm in the next talk from Harald Engler. We know that this is quite specific, uh, what we're doing with the conditioned um, or this learned uh, immune response. We know that the, this is of clinical relevance. Uh, we can affect allograft survival, allergic responses. You can recondition this. Uh, and we have uh, also evidence from rats that it is in, in animals, that, uh, in rats in particular, it is possible to recondition that immune response three, four times during a period of almost a year, which is a long period in the life of a rat. <clears throat> and this is possible, of course, in humans. Now, the open questions we're working at present, and most probably until my retirement, the next 15 years, are these questions here, uh, or first of all, there seem to be no general mechanism. So for this sort of placebo response in the immune system, uh, we identified in our model a few specific mechanisms, whether these mechanisms are also working um, in other uh, immune responses you can modify by learning is unknown so far. Uh, and we are concentrating um, on these questions here regarding the mechanism. So we uh, like to more precisely understand how and via which pathway the CNS senses the changes in the peripheral immune system. Um, so get more knowledge about these afferent pathways. Um, we're concentrating on the CNS because we like to understand which neurotransmitters in the central nervous system are mediating um, this learned immunosuppression. And uh, we, are, as I mentioned before, we are currently um, also concentrating on the specificity of this learned immune response by trying to establish this intracellular um, model and these um, techniques which we uh, have learned from the rat model into the human model to really try to further understand these intracellular uh, mechanisms. Regarding the clinical res relevance, uh, we want to learn how specific, um, this is the question I, uh, with, the, with the mechanisms I mentioned before. Um, we're also concentrating on this point here, whether or not we um, really also conditioned unwanted side effects of the drug. Cyclosporine A, 
is a very potent immunosuppressive drug, but it has also very nasty side effects. So it is nephrotoxic. So it's attacking the, the kidneys. Uh, tumors are increasing in patients who are taking this drug for years. So we have indications, uh, but indirect indications, that we are not be able to condition the unwanted side effects as well. Uh, but we have to sort of prove that with more em empirical um, data. We're concentrating on the, on, the, on the question here about the extinction rates or how long does this immunosuppressive uh, suppression last? Can we repeat it a number of times, three times, ten times, twenty times, or maybe only three times? So we do not know that. And this is the most uh, important question regarding the clinical relevance of the learned immunosuppression. We are concentrating on the synergistical effect with a combination of sub- or low therapeutical drug doses in combination with these learning protocols because this is um, what we have in mind. We see that, as I mentioned before, as part of the placebo response where expectation and associations are um, mediating this placebo response and we have a sort of vision in our mind driving us forward with these um, animal experiments and the human uh, experiments that we want to bring these learning protocols into clinical practice to treat patients um, with these learning protocols with the aim of reducing the dose of medication required. Um, we want to limit unwanted drug side effects and maximizing therapeutic effects in parallel and of course um, we have also the vision to, uh, of saving costs via implementing these learning protocols into clinical um, practice. Now, these are visions, and uh, I'd like to show you as one of the last slides also a, a story uh, which I've learned during my postdoc stay in Australia, and this is a so-called duck story. And the duck story was told by John Dwyer. John Dwyer was a very famous uh, Australian immunologist. And with his duck story, John uh, want to, wanted to sensitize us to be very careful when interpreting scientific results. Right? And the duck story is very short. I'd like to introduce that um, here. If it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, if it quarks like a duck and it tastes like a duck, you can be at most 50% sure that it is a duck. So, right? so keep that in mind So, if you're interpreting so scientific results, not only your own but also that of your colleagues. That's always good. <laughs> right. Of course, this, all the experiments I showed you is a, are experiments which can only be done in a team. And this is, uh, these are members of the team here, part of these um, members. So this is the members of the University of duisburg Essen, your medical faculty, in particular Harald Engler, Mike Exter, my old Australian colleague who left us, went back to Down Under. Uh, Marion Goebel performed the first um, human studies. And this is the team here from uh, uh, medical school working on this um, human model. As Marco mentioned before, I spent three years in, in Zurich at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. This is a team here, in particular Gustavo Pacheco Lopez, who is now going back to Mexico. Uh, we have strong cooperation with our colleagues in Utrecht in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, University of Marburg here with Hugo Bezidowski, Adriana Del Rey, some of the protagonists of psychoneuroimmunology. Um, my old colleague, Jürgen Westermann, who is head of the Department of Anatomy now in the University of Lübeck, my old boss, Uwe Thieves, and then Rainer Straub, of course, with um, whom we have an excellent cooperation since many, many years. Now, before I finish, however, um, I'd like to motivate you, stimulate you, invite you, actually, to come uh, to make a journey next year, uh, because we have next year the Psychoneuroimmunology Research Society meeting in San Diego. So where you can learn, where you meet a very, very nice people, very, very nice people, very nice conference, very nice atmosphere, and you learn much more about this brain immune interaction during this conference here. So the conference will be held here somewhere, so with view on, this, uh, on the harbor, San Diego Harbor. Somewhere here is the old, oh, is the old city, oh, 
old city here, or part, older part of uh, San Diego, so very nice spot, and uh, I would be happy to sort of um, welcome you in San Diego. And if you do not have time to come to San Diego, and if you said, ah, San Diego is boring, San Diego is really boring, you know, I do not like California, maybe it can happen, <laughs> come to the next meeting in 2030, because then it will be in Stockholm. They are close to the, to, the, to the place where they get these funny prices, I think. Right? So, uh, and we have a conference there, the uh, next conference, the Psychoneuroimmunology Research Society, also in June in 2013. So I hope that I can sort of welcome a, at least a few of you uh, at this nice conference. So I close now. It's almost one and a half hour, and um, I'm getting thirsty, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, so no worries. Thank you very much for your attention.